This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you're listening to the Sunday Twilight Show with Moon. It is 5 p.m. on Sunday, the 2nd of July, 2023. You can join me using the chat function. We can discuss today's topic, which is knife crime and education. Welcome! This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org, or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out, with Teachers Talk Radio. Good late afternoon and early evening, fellow educators and dear listeners. This is my 42nd radio show as your hostess, and I'm delighted to share this experience in your company. But first, I have to introduce myself for any new potential listener. I am Maud, a French citizen of French and West African ancestry. I have been living in the United Kingdom since 2008, and I'm a professional educator. I work in a secondary state school in North London, where I teach both languages and humanities, Spanish and French, as well as history and geography. I also have experience as a kindergarten teacher in the charity sector. You can follow me on Twitter at prof. Prof. MFL. All views are my own. Today I want to focus on a topic that is both sensitive and difficult and that is sadly relevant to me as an educator um, and in my daily life. So today's podcast will be on the topic of knife crime in the United Kingdom and its relation to education. This difficult topic is mostly relevant to any parent who has children in the educational sector, school staff, and people work with children, people work in councils, people work in social services and the police. What does knife crime mean? Knife crime means any crime involving an object with a sharp instrument or a blade. When you think about knife crime, you have this very stereotypical image of um, an article in the newspaper, usually with a very young individual involved, male, very often from an ethnic minority, and someone who lives in an urban environment, and someone who is involved either as a perpetrator or as a victim. Knife crime is rising in the UK, and it was Knife Crime Awareness Week from the 15th till the 21st of May 2023. Sadly, there was a grave incident involving knife crime in my um local community and this is why I decided to talk about it in my podcast today. Knife crime in numbers. Well, the police in 2022, this is the latest data I could gather, the police recorded a certain number of offences committed in the United Kingdom over a year involving a knife or sharp blade or instrument. There was 49,265 of these offences. Knife crime is on the increase. From um, 2012 to 2022, there was a 46% rise, so almost half. And the percentage of uh, knife crime in England and Wales has been increasing by 6% as well since last year. So the numbers are rising and the victims number are rising. How many people died uh, because of a blade or sharp instrument in the United Kingdom last year? Well, it's a sad number. It's 282. 
and this is the highest number recorded since 1946. So since the war years, the second world war. So there were 282 murders involving a knife or sharp instrument in England and Wales last year. Of these 282 people were killed by blade or sharp instrument, 99 of them were people under 25, so very young adults. And some of them were even children. 13 out of these 282 victims were children under the age of 16. So in the UK, we do have 282 people who were murdered last year. And amongst them were children. These numbers and statistics are courtesy of the Office of National Statistics. According to the UK Parliament, um, there is a report entitled Knife Crime Statistics. It's available on the House of Commons Library online. And it looks at, it looks at knife crime in England and Wales. Well, in the, the year ending March 2022, so the most recent um, figures, there was a lot of homicide. They were not all involving knives. Some of them also involved broken bottles, but they were all recorded last year and they were all homicides. The Office for National Statistics publishes data on um, recorded crime. And this is something that is obviously completely um, official. And there was a 9% higher rate from 2020 and 2010. So it means that the numbers keep rising and rising and rising. Yet we do not have a policy which tackles knife crime effectively. If the numbers are rising, it's because we are now entering a pandemic and it's called a knife pandemic. We've just been through a viral pandemic with COVID and now we are officially in a knife pandemic. According to a report by the Office for National Statistics, the number of people killed with a knife in England and Wales was the highest on record for 76 years. This is a recent increase driven by 18% rise in the number of male victims. So from 184 to 218 numbers of people who were victim of knife crime in the 12 month to March 2022, most of them were male and younger and younger, as young as teenage boys from 15 to 17. So this increase in recorded levels of knife crime is not just happening in London. I'm not being London-centric here. There's the same issues in uh, Greater Manchester and in other towns in the United Kingdom. But it has been increasing everywhere. So the question is, why do young people and children carry a knife when they walk around town in the UK? Well, there is only one word that can explain why children carry a knife. And they carry it because of fear. Now, it is fear of being attacked, but it is also fear of not being prepared. And also fear of rejection. Fear of being attacked is understandable if you know that there's a high level of knife crime. Fear of not being accepted might be depending on urban street culture and gang culture. But in any case, it is about fear. This is according to Patrick Green. Patrick Green is a specialist of knife crime. He is the chief executive of an anti-knife crime charity. Now, if you haven't heard of this charity, you need to go and check their website today. It's the Ben Kinsella Trust. Ben Kinsella, Kinsella spelled K-I-N-S-E-L-L-A. Ben Kinsella was a teenager in London when I first moved to the UK in 2008. And Ben was celebrating his GCSEs, the end of his GCSEs. He didn't have his grades yet. Ben was with a group of friends in the pub and there was a fight that broke in the pub. Ben was not involved in the 
pub in a in a pub fight at all. But he he felt that the atmosphere was getting sour, so he left. But sadly, Ben and his friends were chased by other people who were in the pub and who blamed them for what had happened. Ben knew he was not involved, so he did not run. He stopped and retraced his footsteps, where some of his friends kept running. And this is what happened to Ben. He was attacked and he was stabbed and he died. So Patrick Green um, works in the trust that was set up by Ben Kinsella's family members because they didn't want any other young people to be killed in the streets of London. Patrick Green says, Some children feel less secure in their community spaces. They are more worried. We know that fear is a factor in terms of carrying a knife. It's one of the motivations. The children feel safe carrying a knife and that alleviates the fear. So this is what specialists of anti-knife crime uh, prevention or, or knife crime prevention are saying. Um, Patrick Green also says that the pervasiveness of knife crime has been underestimated for too long by the government. And we need a more robust public health response to tackle this problem or else we will continue to lose precious young lives to this heinous crime. Patrick Green is not the only person who has some very strong views about the lack of prevention of knife crime. There is another founder of a charity entitled Fighting Knife Crime London. His name is Bruce Holder. And Bruce Holder says that the number of knife crime victims rising over the years is, I quote, highly disturbing. Bruce Holder says that the reasons for the increase in death among young people are very well documented. So we do have access, according to Bruce Holder, to the explanations and to the causes of knife crime. But Bruce Holder says the long-term failure of all governments in the last few decades to get to grips with social deprivation and the loss of hope among many young people needs to be heeded. Mr. Holder also says, as a nation, we need to be ashamed that it has come to this. So this is a little bell I'm trying to raise, an alarm call that I'm trying to raise today via this podcast, because just like you, I used to read about knife crime in the media. And I was thinking it was a tragedy, but it didn't, it didn't feel close to my heart or to my to my family. Now, I have a teenage boy who is um, living in London now, and I'm, wor- I'm worried for him because I know sometimes he goes to a friend's house after school, or he might go to a basketball club, and then he takes the bus back on his own. And I did give him a mobile phone that is not an expensive mobile phone for that purpose, and yet he still managed to experience a mugging. Um, a group, a group of him and his friends were going for a play date back to a friend's house, and then there was one boy who accosted them, threatened them, and in the end didn't even take the mobile phone because it was a um, non-expensive mobile phone. So muggings happen a lot. Now, the problem is when it escalates. And I do not feel safe for my son walking in London, even though we do protect him and we know he doesn't have access to a knife and we know he doesn't carry a knife. But he's not safe. Remember, Ben Kinsella was um, killed and murdered for absolutely no reason and he didn't carry a knife. So there is nothing to protect our young children, our young boys, from being Um, victims of knife crime. Now there is inequalities and racism in knife crime sadly because if you look at the perpetrators but also the victims unlike Ben Kinsella who happened to be white British most of the perpetrators and victims of knife crime remain people from minorities. So black Londoners are only 13% of the London population. And yet, 45% of knife murder victims happen to be black or mixed race. 61% of the perpetrators of knife murders happen to be black or mixed race. 
and 53% of general knife crime perpetrators, not always ending in a homicide, happen to be from the black population. So there is um, inequalities and racism in knife crime. Now, because there's such a representation of one particular group, we might wonder what has been done to prevent knife crime before it even happens by addressing this population, this black London population, and offering resources to prevent knife crime. Black Londoners are still disproportionately more likely to be victims and perpetrators of knife crime. Now, what are we doing to help them? Well, charities like the Ben Kinsella Trust or the Fighting Knife Crime London are trying very hard with um, dwindling funds uh, to do something about prevention. Let's just remember what happens if a child or a teenage boy is caught with a knife. The law says explicitly, if you stab somebody and they happen to die, you might face a life sentence in prison. Then if you possess a knife and you carry it around in public, you might get a prison sentence of up to five years, even if the knife is in a bag and not used. And also, there is the law of joint enterprise. The law of joint enterprise is whether you commit a crime or not, if you happen to be going out with a group of people who are committing a crime, when these people are arrested, you might incur the same sentencing as those who committed a crime. Which, for example, in a, in a situation where a group of five boys attack one other boy, if one of the five boys stabs the young uh, man, and if the young man dies as well, the five boys would be potentially sentenced for a life sentence for murder. This is joint enterprise. Whether you have a knife or not is not even considered. If you are caught in a group with someone who carries a knife and murders someone, you might end up with a life sentence. So this is serious. The law is against knife crime, but it still does not prevent knife crime from happening. So what can we do before a crime is committed? Well, we need to look at children's lives. And when I say the word children, I insist on that. If we look at the victims of knife crime last year, I'm focusing on London because I live in London and it seems to be easier to get all the data. But I'm sure we can make, sadly, the same sort of devastating list in other big cities in the UK. Now, I'm just going to spend a bit of time reading the names of these children because they are children and they should not be forgotten. Donovan Allen was 18 when he was killed in London with a knife. He was stabbed in Ainfield. We also had Tyler Hurley, who was 16, when he died in hospital after suffering stab wounds in the Chadwell Heath area last year, 2022. We had Sabita Tanwani, who was 19, and she was a girl, and she was killed in the Clerkenwell area. We had Tion Campbell Pitter, who was 16, when he was killed in Fordham Park last year. We had Rommel McCoy, who was 16, when he was stabbed in Brixton. Ali Baygoran, who was 17, when he was stabbed in Tottenham. Jeremiah Sewell, who was 19, when he was stabbed in Bellingham. We had Deshaun Tweet, who was 15, when he was stabbed in Highbury Fields in Slington. We had Ghulam Sadiq, who was 18, when he was stabbed on the high road in Leytonstone, Walton Forest. Shia Gordon, who was 17, when he was stabbed in Enfield last year. 
Kane Entrezeshi Moses was 19 when he was stabbed and died of stab injuries in Tottenham last year. Charlie Bartolo was 16 when he was stabbed last year in Greenwich. Kiana Solanke was 16 when he was stabbed in Greenwich last year. Jam Jamali Samba Baibu was 16 when he was killed last year in Clerkenwell. And so many more names. All these children were children. If you're under the age of 18 in the UK, you're considered a child still. Of course, you might look like a young man, but you're still pretty much a child. Anyone who teaches some year 11 will be able to tell you that sometimes they're like big toddlers, just a very um, big size of them. Um, the problem with knife crime, as I said, is that it's not just targeting gang members, which would be the stereotype we have when we look at the media reporting. Knife crime can happen unprovoked. And it can be someone who's got nothing to do with gangs and who has never carried a knife. I'll give you a story. This is the story of Jodie Cheney. She was 17. And she had a loving, close-knit family. She lived in Barking, Dagenham. And she was attending sixth form and she was doing her A-levels in psychology, sociology and photography. She was a very lovely girl. She had done her Duke of Edinburgh's award. She was a scout. She was volunteering. She liked to run 5Ks. She was really interested in photography as i said and she spent a lot of time doing photography with her friends jody does not fit the profile of someone who would be ending up in a gang jody is white and she's a girl and she's never inv been involved in any crime and yet jody was stabbed on march the 1st 2019 she was in a park and someone just attacked her someone wearing a balaclava, and it was an unprovoked attack. Judy wasn't even aware of what happened to her because she was stabbed in the back. She died on the spot. Now, the problem with this sort of crime is that they're terrifying, and as a parent, this is your worst nightmare. And Judy was stabbed on her dad's birthday. Let's not even imagine how um, any days after that must feel for um, Jody's birthday. But he said in his victim statement, in fact, that he, he, this murder had destroyed his life. Now, the problem with knife crime is that we tend to think that as long as our children are on the right path and not involved in gangs, they'll be fine. Well, they won't, because they know this is happening. And when an, a murder happens in a community, Everybody feels tainted by it. Now, I happened to be working in a community that suffered because of a murder last week. It is something that we are going to have to deal with as a teacher. And I can tell you that when I did my teacher training in 2020, no one gave us a lecture at university on how to deal with knife crime in education. And this is partly why I'm doing this podcast today, because there are things that can help before, during and after a knife crime attack. It is important to know that there is support for anyone who is fearful of knife crime and also who has experienced it. As I mentioned before, the Ben Kinsella Trust is a very important website to look at. There's plenty of resources for parents, for teachers, but also for children. On the Ben Kinsella Trust website, you can be given a whole lesson plan on how to approach knife crime. Now, the irony of my own situation as a teacher is that two weeks ago, we were preparing for our end of year assessments and we had to watch a video about what to do when we are witnessing a knife crime attack. So the, the uh, advice in the video was pretty clear. When witnessing a knife crime, we need to first call an ambulance. 
always call an ambulance first. Then, if there is no more danger, if the perpetrators are not in the place anymore, if they've run away, you can come close to the victim and talk to the victim and offer help. You need to make sure that the victim does not confuse you with a potential attacker. So you need to speak calmly to the victim and say, hello, my name is so-and-so and I'm here to help. I've called an ambulance. When you are witnessing a knife attack or when there's a knife attack victim in front of you, you need to take off one piece of clothing, of your own clothing, a scarf, a blazer, a sweater, and you need to wrap the body part that has suffered a stab wounds with your jumper or sweater or scarf and apply pressure directly onto the wound. This is in order to stop the bleeding. Now, if the knife is still in the victim's body, never remove the blade because you might make more um, blood loss. It might create more blood loss. So if, let's say, there is a knife in the upper arm and it's still there, leave the knife where it is, but apply a sweater or scarf around the knife and apply pressure onto it to stem the blood flow. Keep talking to the person and make them talk to you. Try and make them say what happened. Try and make them say their age, their name, and maybe their phone number. And in the meantime, stay calm, keep talking to them and try and get someone else to come and help as well in order to talk to the ambulance more if you need another ambulance or if the police arrives. So this is what you need to do if you are witnessing a knife crime. Call an ambulance first. Make sure there's no perpetrator in the vicinity still. Approach the victim and tell them calmly you're here to help. Take some of your own clothing that you won't miss and apply pressure with it onto the stab wound. Do not remove the knife if there's still a stab wound. Talk to the person calmly, keep them awake and wait for an ambulance. So this is what I taught my students two weeks before their summer assessments. Then we got the summer assessments and they did pretty well. A lot of them remembered about not removing the knife and placing a piece of clothing onto the wound. Not many remembered to call the ambulance first. Um, and I guess, I hope that will be their first port of call, but I'm going to I'm going to tell them again that they have to call the ambulance first because once you've applied pressure, your hands are, are busy and you can't uh, not apply the pressure anymore. So you won't have the possibility to call the ambulance after that. So I was happy I did my job as a PSHCE teacher and I told my students what to do when they, are vic they see a victim. But two weeks later, we've had a knife crime um incident in our community. There was none of my students who witnessed it, but my students are all aware of who was the victim, what happened to the victim, and where it happened. And the tragedy is it happened in front of their home or school area. So now we end up having approximately 600 students who are um, traumatized because they are much aware that their local area is unsafe because one of them has been the victim of a knife crime. So what can we do as a teacher? The problem is that we never have a policy at hand when we really need it. So when I turned up for work on that particular day, I was told what had happened, but I didn't have anything to support me as a teacher in my teaching. So I just went on with my teaching and I tried to give the students a relaxed and calm and safe space environment for them to do their lesson. And then a member of SLT came and mentioned the incident and we told the students to go straight home afterwards and to speak with their loved ones. If they had any issues, they could also talk to the pastoral team. Now, the problem is we're going to have to address what happened because knife crime is severe trauma. 
Knife crime means that you're not safe in the street. Knife crime means that anyone is a potential perpetrator. Anyone who's got a bag, anyone who's got long pockets could be a perpetrator. And knife crime means that you, as a young person, are fearful. And if you're fearful, you might consider that carrying a knife might be a way to defend yourself. Of course it doesn't, but this is the main issue, isn't it? Knife crime is about fear. So what should we do when we go back to school after a weekend and when we have to address that trauma? So we believe as educators that talking is really important, but we need to make sure there's a safe space and that no one is going to use someone's words against them. So I'm recommending a little activity that I'm going to try this Monday when I go back to school in my PSHC lesson. You give a little piece of paper to each child in your class and you ask them to write something they would like to say about what happened. It has to be confidential, so no names, and it has to be honest and personal and no one's going to read it because you personally collect all these messages and then they put it, you put it in a jam jar, empty jam jar, clean jam jar, obviously. And then you keep these little messages and you ask the students, how do you feel after writing these messages? Do you feel a bit better? And the, the aim is to allow speaking out or writing out all these emotions because we don't want them to fester. I wouldn't advise reading the messages. I would just do something symbolic. So I would ask the students, would you like me to read them or would you like me to um, later on, at a later stage, set them on fire so that the worry turns into ashes? Or would you like me to maybe put them uh, buried in a garden or maybe put them where the knife crime has happened with a candle and a teddy bear. So just do something so that their words have been let out and they're not festering inside anymore, but also you give them a way out so they don't need to always confront exactly what their words mean, but they can also have just a symbolic gesture. I believe that letting the, the worry burn is a very symbolic, obviously do it uh, at home, in your garden, on a barbecue or something, and then bring back the ashes and show the students and tell them, this is all the worry and all the emotions you had. We let them go and now we turn them into ashes and we can use them And in the garden. I bet every school has a little plot of land where you can put the ashes, spread the ashes and symbolically say, let's hope that all our worries and emotions can just let go and we can then move on with our lives. So a symbolic gesture, a little bit like a worry box is always a small activity that can have a lot of impact. If you want to let everybody share their views, you can also offer them to do a big card and then they can say all the things they want to say to the person who didn't make it because they were victims of knife crime. And then you can bring it to the funerals or to the, um, if there's a, if there's a meeting or to, you can bring it to the family, but make sure you read everything so that there's nothing that could be misconstrued. Now remind your students not to make comments on social media, because if someone is the victim of a gang, the problem is the gang might be looking for new targets. So be very direct in your um, and tell your students that there is always a risk if it's gang related. So they should be really careful what they say and write online. And also, if you have students who don't want to talk about it, respect it because not everybody likes to share their emotions. Some people deal with their grief in private, so it shouldn't be forceful. You can always give an opportunity to come and talk to you afterwards. Now, I would always recommend a minute of, a minute of silence. We do it on the 11th of November for all the victims of the First and Second World War. I think it's also good to do a minute of silence for anyone who's uh, a victim of a homicide or a victim of knife crime as a sign of respect and because it allows everybody to come together and reflect at the same time. 
And this togetherness is extremely healing and cathartic. So my advice for dealing with the aftermath of such a trauma as a knife crime in the community are um, offering support in your classroom by letting them write down their feelings in a confidential way, using the symbolism of um, turning the paper and the words into ashes so that they can, you know, be renewed, and also a minute of silence. And obviously, using all the resources that you can gather from the Ben Kinsella Trust website, dealing with knife crime prevention and postvention. It is always important to give clear facts to the students, clear data so that they know where they stand. Um, I'm going to let you um, take a breather because I know it's a very difficult subject. We are educators. We want our children to thrive. We do not want them to be victim of murder or victim of knife attacks. And yet these terrible tragedies happen daily. So I'm going to let you take a breather with the news and we'll get back to our difficult subject afterwards. Thank you for listening to the news. It's time for a fresh start to language learning. Pearson Edexcel's new student-centered French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. The BBC reported on the high cost of school uniforms. Whilst this is nothing new, the current cost of living crisis has brought the issue back into focus. The charity, The Children's Society, claims in the report that parents are spending an average of £422 a year on secondary and £287 on primary uniforms. This is despite rules that were meant to lower the cost. The government commented that it was working to ensure uniform costs are reasonable. The BBC reports that some parents have said that they are having to choose between uniforms and holidays because prices have increased the Children's Society said it had polled 2,000 parents across the UK and found that parents could be paying an average of £75 for coats and bags, an average of £63 for sports clothing and around £62 for school shoes. Under changes to the Education Act last year, schools in England are meant to be helping cut costs for parents. However, the Children's Society found pupils were still expected to have three to five branded items as part of uniform. Whilst many schools now offer pre-loved uniform to struggling families, parents and charities continue to say that more must be done. FE Week reports on the new NHS workforce plan, calling it a fantastic opportunity for the FE sector. In an opinion piece by Robert Halfen, the plan is claimed to put apprenticeships and skills training at the heart of the NHS workforce strategy. The FE sector already offers training for apprenticeships in a range of core healthcare roles, such as dental nurse, healthcare support worker and pharmacy technician. But the new plan seeks to broaden the range and routes into working for the NHS. The government has announced £40 million of funding over the next two years to help eligible providers expand degree apprenticeships. £48 million of funding is also backing the higher technical qualification in healthcare roles. The BBC features concerns about the number of nurseries closing in England, after more than 400 closed in the last year. The sector is blaming chronic underfunding and rising costs. The National Day Nurseries Association said the data raised serious questions about whether there would be enough places to deliver the government's promised expansion of free childcare. In the year to the end of March, the number of nurseries fell from 27,291 to 26,884, 
with the overall number of places dropping by 3,512. When childminders were included, the overall number of childcare places fell by 24,521. In March's budget, the Chancellor announced the extension of the current scheme, offering some families in England 33 hours of childcare per week for three to four year olds to cover younger children. The change would be phased in from April next year. Nurseries say the amount of government payment does not cover costs leading to closures for some businesses. A Department of Education spokesperson said that the picture was broadly positive, as the decrease in places was only 2% on last year, although it was recognised that there are some local challenges. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, this week I'm going to talk VPN. For those of you thinking, why is Steve talking about an underwear fashion faux pas? A VPN is a virtual private network, and knowing a little bit about them might make you realise you actually need one. What is it? Well, in a nutshell, a VPN changes how internet data is transmitted from a device. It allows the user to be more hidden. I know what you're thinking. I'm no cyber criminal. Why do I want to conceal my data? Well, let's look at three things a VPN can do for you. I'm going to use a phone as an example, but all of these can be applied to any device you can put on the internet. Do you use public networks? A public network may be the Wi-Fi on the bus or train, a local coffee shop or fast food restaurant, any connection that isn't your home. Transmitting data on these networks can potentially allow your data to be intercepted by third parties. Having a VPN allows you to encrypt your data from your device rather than depending on the network you're connecting to. So, when surfing the web while enjoying a burger and fries, you can be confident if you're being intercepted, the data will be useless to the interceptor. The next is shopping online. When connecting to an online shop, some stores use your location and unique device ID to target you. If you're returning to look at a product, the likelihood is you're going to buy it. Knowing this, some stores use clever algorithms to increase the price to maximize their profit. With a VPN, you can mask this data so the price you see is the initial price. The third is some streaming services are blocked by internet providers or unavailable from outside of certain countries. If you're using a VPN, you can choose where to set your location to allow you to see the content you wish to stream. I've not looked at individual providers. Some are free, some are paid for. If you're unsure, find a friend who's using one, ask them about it, and use the same one as them to begin with. Then you get free tech support. Make sure you know the terms of service. You don't want the VPN you're using keeping your data, as that would defeat the object in the first place. As always, don't forget to check out the TT Radio Twitter feed. Tell us what you want to know about tech. I'm Steve Woods, and that was Two Minute Tech. Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods. Your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Thank you for listening to the news, dear listeners. So we're back on our difficult topic, which is knife crime in education. Um, I really advise any listeners to go and check the Ben Kinsella Trust website because it has very, very good resources for teachers, for parents, and for uh, children as well. So who was Ben Kinsella? Um, Ben was a young teenage boy um, who lived in Islington in 2008, and he had just done his GCSE, so he was celebrating with friends at the pub. Um, Inside the pub, a fight broke down, which changed the mood a little bit so Ben and his friends decided to leave the pub and they went home but on their way on their way home they realized that they were being followed by three older teenagers that they did not know they became scared and worried so they decided to run but the older teenagers kept running after them Um, apparently the older teenagers confused Ben and his friends with the people who started the fight in the pub. So they wanted revenge for the altercation that happened earlier. Because Ben and his friends had nothing to do with it, uh, Ben suddenly decided I was not involved, so he stopped running. The older boys caught up with him and they attacked him and stabbed him several times. He collapsed and died on the scene. Ben was not a gang member. He he had never met or spoken to the three boys who attacked him. He wasn't involved in youth violence or gangs. He didn't take any drugs. He was from a well-loving family. His sister is now a famous East Ender actress. He was a normal teenager having fun in the streets of London. And yet his mum, Debbie, 
read her impact statement at the trial of his three uh, murderers, and she said, I quote, The people who murdered Ben knew nothing about our Ben, not a hair on his head, a bone in his body, not anything about our wonderful son. They had never met him before or spoken to him, and they just cruelly took his life away with knives for no apparent reason. So that was in 2008, um, and it was the 29th of June. And sadly, in my local community where I work, another young boy, age 15, was killed on the 29th of June 2023. So it seems like this anniversary is devastating because a few streets away, history repeats itself. Ben Kinsella was a victim of um, just a wrong gang culture or a a culture where knives are the answer or a synonym of manhood or virility of strength or power and it still is a culture that pervades the streets negatively so what can we do as teachers and educators when we have students who might be influenced by that culture or when we have students that we care for and we really don't want them to be victims of unprovoked um, attacks. So there are plenty of websites, as I re- mentioned. Ben Kinsella Trust offers workshops that can be useful for teachers if you want to invite them to come to your schools. There is also another website, Lives Not Knives, where they do um, mentoring sessions, they create roadshow, youth hub, they have a summer program. Basically, what they're trying to do is to occupy the children. Because remember, perpetrators are often children who live lives of severe deprivation, poverty, uh, lack of cultural capital, lack of financial capital, lack of community, lack of parenting, lack of further figure, lack of occupations once they're not in school or if they are absent from schools they spend their lives just wandering in the streets listening to music watching questionable video content on youtube that celebrates violence and uh, knife possessions so to to fight against knife crime we need to fight against poverty because the people commit these crimes are not people who are well healed. They're not people who have a future. They're not people who travel, who go on holidays, who can afford to go surfing or skiing. Or These young perpetrators are people who have nothing. And when you have nothing, you don't care about other people's lives because your life, to your own eyes, that doesn't have any worth. You feel worthless. You feel disenfranchised. And when you you are violent, you get a kick out of it. So if we want to stop this negative culture, we need to give hope, we need to stop fear, and we need to spend money on our young people. So this is a simple program, which the government hasn't been taking into account in the last 12, 13 years, which is why the 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 rate of knife crime is increasing in our city. So what can we do for the young generation? Well, we can start by teaching them strong moral values. And I know most teachers do this, this, but we need also to make a call to the parents because children who are disenfranchised are children who are not always receiving the support they need at home. So we also need to ask parents to make sure they know where their children are, that children are not left to carry knives. So maybe parents should check their children's bags. And also parents should make sure that there is no content that is promoting violence and extreme urban violence. Um, that their children have access to. Your children should not have access to knives. Your children should not have access to a balaclava. Your children should be um, having strong moral values. School can't just do that on its own. Teachers try really hard. We do PSHC lessons. We do assemblies. We talk about being respectful to one another. But then respect needs also to come from the family base. If you want to help, 
you can do outreach as well. If you have children, make sure you check their bags. If your child tells you of another child who has a knife, you might want to raise the alarm. You might want to check with your local police station or to um, mention it to the pastoral team in the schools. Remember, most local police station offer a service of recycling knives. If you find a knife, you can call your police station with 111 and then you drop the knife in an amnesty bin. The knives would be uh, recycled to make um, playground uh, apparatus for children. So this is the easiest way to get rid of knives that you find, if you find any. Call the local police, not on 999, that's for emergency, just on 111. And then you can... Um, you can give the knife in a put the knife in an amnesty bin. If you want to recycle the knife and it's all metal, make sure you wrap it se 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 several times with newspaper, cello tape it so that the newspaper doesn't undo itself, and then put it in a plastic bag, and then you can carry it safely. If you have concerns about a student in your school, about a neighbor in your area, or about any child you think is maybe following the wrong crowd or uh, watching the wrong type of content, or do you think if you think they carry a knife, you need to cr to call um, the a service and uh, there's a number. It's zero two zero seven five two seven two six double zero, and I repeat zero two zero seven five two seven. 2600. That's for help and advice on how to deal with it. And now, if you are victim of a crime, if you have been victim of a knife crime or any crime and you would like support, and you, if you're based in London, there's also some victim support phone lines 0808 168 9111. 0808 168 9111. Now, if you are in an emergency and someone's life is at risk, you call 999. If you want to report an antisocial behavior incident, you call the non-emergency number for the police and it's 101. 999 for emergency and at risk of losing a life, 101 for non-emergency, but when you have worries about someone who is showing signs of antisocial behavior or if you want to report a crime that is not an emergency. You need to know the law as an educator but also as a parent. So remember carrying a knife or a gun is illegal and you can be prosecuted for just carrying it. The police is legally allowed to use their powers to stop and search someone if they think a weapon is being carried. And um, if your child has a criminal record because they carried a knife, it can stop your child from getting entry to university, from getting a job, or place restrictions on visiting some countries. You need to inform your child of all the risks if they carry a knife in their bags. Carrying a weapon increases the risk of the child to be injured. Uh, carrying a weapon leads to four to five uh, um, years of um, sentence for, for possession of a knife. Uh, it's up to four years for a knife and it's five years for a gun, even if you carry it for someone else. And in a worst case scenario, remember if they hurt a person with a knife, uh, it could be manslaughter or homicide and that could be life, a life sentence. So please parents, check your child's bags, and also tell them the law. If you're worried as a parent that your child has friends who are obviously getting into trouble, you might want to raise the awareness of the issue and you need to contact a children's services contact team. Uh, you can call Childline, you can call any um, child protection agency, just um, make sure you have enough information, either an area or a phone number or a name, and then they can flag it to the social services, the police or the schools or the local authority um, designated safeguarding lead.
And remember, you can always call the police on a non-emergency uh, number, the 101. And then you have also Crime Stoppers, 0800-555-111. They also have an online form and it's anonymous. And that's if you want to report a crime. If you saw a child who was carrying a knife, you can report it there. So we need to do prevention. Prevention at school, it's the pastoral team, it's the PSHD teachers, it's also the school policies and the content of assemblies. Now we can do more, we can ask people from charities such as the Ben Kinsella Trust to come and do workshops with the children in order to raise awareness. As parents, we need to make sure of what's under our noses and what's in our kids' bags and in their bedrooms. We need to check if they possess a knife. We need to check that they're not accessing violent content on YouTube or on other social media. And we need to tell our children of the risks. Four years for carrying a knife, five for a gun, life um, sentence for hurting someone for manslaughter, homicide, and also many restrictions for just having a criminal record. But we also need to foster a sense of community where we value morality and that the, where the common good prevails. So if you are in a community where there's a culture where when there's a crime, nobody's supposed to report it because you don't want it to be a snitch. If you live in a community where uh, young men value strength, virility, um, aggression, um, weapons as a sign of manhood, you need to also think about what sort of ideology you're supporting by, by not saying anything. In order to foster a sense of community that brings positive values, we also need to make sure we model these values. Um, if you want to have more resources, as I said, there is plenty of very good quality resources on the Ben Kinsella .org.uk, um, the website. And we also need to think as teachers and educators, what have we got in place in case there's a knife crime attack in our community? Because you don't want to feel bereft of tools in order to address the issue. So first, we need to have more transparency. We need to, as adults, express to children that if they're upset, adults are also upset and adults are also shocked and adults are also really sad. And it's okay to feel all these emotions. And we need to help the children label these emotions. We need to tell the children, you might feel angry now, but actually that anger is an expression of your sadness. It's just one way of expressing it, but it is deeply sadness. And you don't have to nurture that anger into retaliation or revenge. That anger needs to be assessed for what it is, an emotional reaction when you face incredible sadness. And sometimes by just acknowledging that anger, you also diffuse it. It's okay to be angry because you're sad, but what you need to face is the sadness. And mourning or accepting um, a tragic event takes time, but it takes practice and knowledge. We need to teach our children how to mourn because we forget in our Western societies that we do actually, are, we are alive. And once we're alive, we also have to face death, whether our own, whether our parents, whether our friends, we will all have to face death at one stage and we need to be prepared for it. So it's important to have to have postvention uh, resources at um, the ready. The pastoral team knows a lot. Give time enough for everybody to be able to access the pastoral team support if needed. But there's also something we can do and it's allowing creativity and expression, self-expression. What makes us different from other mammals, what makes us special animals is that we express ourselves through art. So it's important, I think, to give an opportunity for anyone who's suffering a trauma of what happened in a community to use the arts 
whether music or drawing or sculpting or any art craft that is cathartic. We need to allow our students to express their pains, their pain and their feelings, because it's cathartic. We can't rush mourning. We can't also say, oh, we need to crack on because life keeps going. Life and death will happen every day, but we can't ignore it. We need to accept it and work around it. Obviously, avoiding retaliation, and that implies that uh, in the light of what's happening in France, by the way, um, we need to make sure as parents that if our children are upset, they are also able to demonstrate and protest in a proper way. So there are always um, charities and associations that organize protest in a legal way, and we should encourage children to attend these legal protests, such as La Marche Blanche, in honor of Nael, who was uh, killed by the police last week. But we should not encourage our children to express their emotion and sadness through anger by attacking, um, attacking places or burning buildings. It is our duty as parents to make sure our children are not outside at night if there is rioting going on. Because we have ways to express ourselves and anger and destruction will not lead to change, not to progressive change anyway. So organizing event to communicate and mourn together is the answer. Organizing uh, funerals, attending funerals, uh, having a time to grieve together, and also not making grief and mourning taboo, but voicing it out, attending a death cafe, for instance, and you can always check the deathcafe.co.uk if you want to have the next available meeting dates and location. So it is our duties as adults to encourage self-expression when mourning or when dealing with deep trauma in a community, but it has to be done in a way that is not damaging to our children and to our local community as well. Um, there is a call for better mental health and support and access to services because knife crime brings knife trauma and it brings tragedy and it brings mourning and it brings more trauma. So the more fear we have in the community, the more knives will be carried by children and by young people. So we need to address mental health and we need to give access to it. There is a mental health crisis in this country. There are not enough services available for young people. And these services are sometimes even harder to reach if you're from an ethnic minority. And remember, perpetrators and victims of knife crime are disproportionately more from certain communities which do not already have access to uh, mental health services. So we need to make that a change. We need to fund social care and we need to fund better mental health support. Um, the focus on mental health is crucial because we have a young generation of people who are brought up in a community that has suffered. In my local community where I work, we've just had a murder. So all these children, and it's almost 600 children, will have to leave, to live, sorry, with that knowledge that the streets of London are not safe for them and that they are at risk when they pop outside their houses. This is trauma. So we need to deal with what violent death means. Figures obtained by the NSPCC show that in two of London's largest mental health trusts, the number of children being referred from education settings has increased dramatically in the past three years, and a considerable number of them are refused help because there's not enough staff. So we've had COVID, which was traumatic in itself. We've had more poverty with a rising inflation, and then we add to that a violent death. This is a deadly cocktail for our young generation. We need to have more funding. And I would say in any community where a death occurs due to knife crime, we should have 
a budget allocated to support the mental health of the children in that community. It is essential. So Tom Isaac is a youth worker and he heads up a service entitled Oasis Youth. And he's talking about mental health in the UK. So I'm just going to quote Tom Isaac. He says, there are also a lot of young people who have had to witness murders of teenagers right outside their block. Can you imagine the trauma of living here and growing up here and what that does to your psyche? All of the children need safety, support and counselling to help them process what they've gone through. So Isaac um, is, is noticed over the years since he funded his service, Oasis Youth, that the thresholds for child and adolescent mental health services, which stands for CAMHS, C-A-M-H-S, it has been increasing over the years with due to budget cuts. So it's harder for young people to receive the support they need. And in terms of crisis, like after um, a violent crime has been committed, it's even more needed. So come, um, there's an, another, another person who talks in The Independent, he's called Howard, and he says, children are wit witnessing either directly or secondhand that young people are losing their lives. So for them, it shows that they're living in fear because they're constantly having to watch their backs. These things are not conducive to positive mental health. It's a very important thing to say. A lot of um, victims of stabbing have actually been stabbed in their backs. So obviously it is very cowardly to attack someone from the back, but it just shows that these children will never walk without having a slight tingle of fear at their neck or their back because they know that they can be a target. And it's a horrible way to live in 2023 in um, a big developed country such as England. So what can we do as parents? We can't follow our children all the time. How can we deal with our anxiety? Because if the children are fearful, parents are terrified as well. Well, it might be a solution in case there's a knife attack. Um, Anthony Pelletier has developed a bleed kit He's a campaigner and he's calling for businesses, so anyone who works on the high street and also school staff to carry a bleed kit. So Anthony Pelletier was a head teacher and now he works at the Shakan Sami Plummer Foundation based in Finsbury Park, Islington. And he says that bleed kits should be destigmatized and embraced by everyone. The way defibrillators for heart attacks need to be uh, spread out, bleed kits should be available. Anthony Peltier says that over 7,000 people die a year of catastrophic bleeding, whether it's at home, in the garden or the street, after a fall. It's not always due to a knife attack. It might be um, falling and bumping their heads or um, hurting themselves with the gardening tool, but a bleed kit might save a life. There's people who have died of catastrophic bleeds in an office, said Mr. Pelletier. So a bleed kit is not just for knife crime. It's a simple first aid kit, a bleed kit, but it has six things in it. And these six things are designed to stop a heavy bleeding. The foundation that Mr. Pelletier has in Finsbury Park has, um, was set up after the death uh, at a party uh, of uh, Sam Shakan Sami Plummer. So a, a bleed kit is a simple thing that any off-license owner should have or any Marks Spencer or any shops could have. It costs 80 quid and it can stop a major bleed. It seems like for every child who's the victim of a knife crime, um, their parent need to find meaning in the loss of their child. Because it's so nonsensical to lose a child because of a knife in a developed city. So there is another um, child who was victim of knife crime and he was called um, Godwin. And um, Godwin 
has a mother who is fighting for his name to be remembered, Yvonne. Yvonne Lawson was Godwin Lawson's mum. And um, Godwin was killed um, by a knife crime in 2011. Godwin Lawson was not a gang member. He was stabbed in the street um, by former young men he didn't know. He was 17. He was um, on a scholarship to play football and he was very ambitious and hardworking. So Yvonne, Yvonne Lawson started a foundation called GodwinLawsonFoundation.org. You can check on um, websites. And she was awarded an MBE 10 years after the death of her son in 2020. She met um, David Cameron, Theresa May and Boris Johnson, and she pushed for a new law to be implemented. And she won after all her hard work. So Yvonne... Um, pushed for new legislation. And this legislation came into force in 2015. So it took her five years to get to that stage. Um, and this legislation is the requirement of a mandatory sentence of at least six months for anyone caught carrying a knife for the second time. So she's trying to toughen the laws around possession of a knife, which means that if you're caught once, with a knife, you might not be prosecuted for that. But if you caught a second time, you will automatically get six months in prison. So thank you, um, Yvonne Lawson, for uh, this hard work to protect our children, because Yvonne Lawson said she doesn't want any other family to go through the pain she's been through with the losses of her son, Godwin. It was a very hard um, podcast to make today. I have to say I'm still very emotional because of what happened in my um, working community. It's, uh, it's always a tragedy when we lose a young person, but it's even worse when it's due to a murder. It's hard enough when there is a car crash or an accident or drowning, but the fact that young people are killed in the streets in the UK because other young people or other people carry knives is just incomprehensible. And it struck home because I always, like most people, read the media, read the news and felt, oh, wow, this is terrible, but it's far and remote from my own little bubble of life in my privileged uh, area. And then my son got mugged and then I have um, people I know have been victims of murder last week. So I feel like it's it's creeping closer and closer. And I think this is what happens when you work with children. When you work with children, you realize that poverty affects them. Knife crime affects them. Fear affects them. Depra de deprivation affects them. And governmental policies affects them. The mental health uh, crisis, the lack of support, um, the NHS being on its knees, budget cuts, all of this has an impact on my career and my work because the children I have in front of me are suffering because of this. So I'm trying to raise awareness with that podcast. Please share it so that everybody can have the data and some means to to get prepared in case this happens, because sadly, tragedy can always happen anywhere. And it's better to be prepared, to have some resources at hand and to know what to say and, and do and to avoid more heartache. So tomorrow is Monday, I'll go back to work and I'll try and do my best to support my students who, are, who have faced deep life changing trauma over the weekend. Um, I'm going to play the news one more time and then we'll wrap up this podcast. Thank you. It's time for a fresh start to language learning. Pearson Edexcel's new student-centred French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. 
Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. The BBC reported on the high cost of school uniforms. Whilst this is nothing new, the current cost of living crisis has brought the issue back into focus. The charity, the Children's Society, claims in the report that parents are spending an average of £422 a year on secondary and £287 on primary uniforms. This is despite rules that were meant to lower the cost. The government commented that it was working to ensure uniform costs are reasonable. The BBC reports that some parents have said that they are having to choose between uniforms and holidays because prices have increased the Children's Society said it had polled 2,000 parents across the UK and found that parents could be paying an average of £75 for coats and bags, an average of £63 for sports clothing and around £62 for school shoes. Under changes to the Education Act last year, schools in England are meant to be helping cut costs for parents. However, the Children's Society found pupils were still expected to have three to five branded items as part of uniform. Whilst many schools now offer pre-loved uniform to struggling families, parents and charities continue to say that more must be done. FE Week reports on the new NHS workforce plan, calling it a fantastic opportunity for the FE sector. In an opinion piece by Robert Halfen, the plan is claimed to put apprenticeships and skills training at the heart of the NHS workforce strategy. The FE sector already offers training for apprenticeships in a range of core healthcare roles, such as dental nurse, healthcare support worker and pharmacy technician. But the new plan seeks to broaden the range and routes into working for the NHS. The government has announced £40 million of funding over the next two years to help eligible providers expand degree apprenticeships. £48 million of funding is also backing the higher technical qualification in healthcare roles. The BBC features concerns about the number of nurseries closing in England, after more than 400 closed in the last year. The sector is blaming chronic underfunding and rising costs. The National Day Nurseries Association said the data raised serious questions about whether there would be enough places to deliver the government's promised expansion of free childcare. In the year to the end of March, the number of nurseries fell from 27,291 to 26,884, with the overall number of places dropping by 3,512. When childminders were included, the overall number of childcare places fell by 24,521. In March's budget, the Chancellor announced the extension of the current scheme offering some families in England 33 hours of childcare per week for three to four year olds to cover younger children. The change would be phased in from April next year. Nurseries say the amount of government payment does not cover costs leading to closures for some businesses. A Department of Education spokesperson said that the picture was broadly positive as the decrease in places was only 2% on last year, although it was recognised that there are some local challenges. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, this week I'm going to talk VPN. For those of you thinking, why is Steve talking about an underwear fashion faux pas? A VPN is a virtual private network, and knowing a little bit about them might make you realise you actually need one. What is it? Well, in a nutshell, a VPN changes how internet data is transmitted from a device. It allows the user to be more hidden. I know what you're thinking. I'm no cyber criminal. Why do I want to conceal my data? Well, let's look at three things a VPN 
can do for you. I'm going to use a phone as an example, but all of these can be applied to any device you can put on the internet. Do you use public networks? A public network may be the Wi-Fi on the bus or train, a local coffee shop or fast food restaurant, any connection that isn't your home. Transmitting data on these networks can potentially allow your data to be intercepted by third parties. Having a VPN allows you to encrypt your data from your device rather than depending on the network you're connecting to. So, when surfing the web while enjoying a burger and fries, you can be confident if you're being intercepted, the data will be useless to the interceptor. The next is shopping online. When connecting to an online shop, some stores use your location and unique device ID to target you. If you're returning to look at a product, the likelihood is you're going to buy it. Knowing this, some stores use clever algorithms to increase the price to maximize their profit. With a VPN, you can mask this data so the price you see is the initial price. The third is some streaming services are blocked by internet providers or unavailable from outside of certain countries. If you're using a VPN, you can choose where to set your location to allow you to see the content you wish to stream. I've not looked at individual providers. Some are free, some are paid for. If you're unsure, find a friend who's using one, ask them about it, and use the same one as them to begin with. Then you get free tech support. Make sure you know the terms of service. You don't want the VPN you're using keeping your data, as that would defeat the object in the first place. As always, don't forget to check out the TT Radio Twitter feed. Tell us what you want to know about tech. I'm Steve Woods, and that was Two Minute Tech. Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods. Your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Thank you for listening to the to this podcast on knife crime and education in the UK. This podcast uh, was dedicated to the memory of Leonardo Reed, age 15, who was murdered last Thursday on the 29th of June 2023. My condolences to his loved one and family. Thank you. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.